so yeah, let's um, let's just make a start if that's okay. Um, there may be a few more that join us. Um, first of all, hello and welcome. Uh, thank you very much uh, for tuning in this evening. Um, this this evening's webinar, building a brand. Where do I start? through the Farm Advisory Service. This is the first of two uh, webinars that we're uh, doing this week, um, taking a look at building a brand uh, for your farm. My name is Callum Johnston. I will be the host for this evening's session. I am a consultant with SEC Consulting, and my job um, primarily involves supporting rural businesses across Scotland. So that's farmers, crofters, uh, and food and drink businesses, um, predominantly in diversification and agri-tourism. Um, I've got a farming background. Uh, those of you uh, logging on who know me already uh, will know that I live on a small um, a small holding just outside um, Perth, between Perth and Dundee. And when I'm not working at SAC Consulting, uh, I'm usually looking after our uh, small flock of Shetland sheep. And those of you who have got Shetland sheep at home will know that the Shetland breed is not very productive and the wool price is next to nothing. Um, so it is purely a hobby and uh, and I love it. Um, also joining us uh, this evening, we have got Caroline Piggott. Caroline's there on the, on the screen. Caroline is a dual qualified trademark attorney and IP solicitor, believed to be the only one in Scotland. Car Caroline's uh, interests are in food and drink, agriculture and technology. And Caroline works at HGF, HGF is a specialist intellectual property firm with offices uh, across Scotland. Uh, they're based in Edinburgh, Glasgow and Aberdeen. Caroline is based in Edinburgh, so joining us from Edinburgh. Uh, Caroline is also uh, the chair of the Intellectual Property Committee at the Law Society of Scotland. So yeah, that's quite a CV, Caroline. Thank you very much for, uh, for taking time out this evening to join us. And Pleasure. our... No problem. Our main speaker this evening is Kerry Allison. Kerry is there. Kerry is a senior marketing and branding consultant with SEC Consulting. Kerry has worked uh, for SEC now for four years and has worked with hundreds uh, of businesses all across Scotland uh, and across many other parts of the UK as well. Um, designing and creating inspira inspirational brands for rural businesses and Kerry's specific interests. She's an expert in digital platforms and creating meaningful and lasting connections between enterprise and customers. So that is our speakers. We also have one additional member of the team. Um, we've got Malcolm McDonald. Malcolm is working behind the scenes. He is our production and technical uh, assistant. Uh, Malcolm also works for SEC Consulting, is a consultant up in um, on the Black Isle. He has, he's got clients all over the north of Scotland. And Malcolm is also um, from a farming background. So thanks for taking time out this evening, Malcolm. I know you're not on the screen just now, uh, but we do really appreciate um, your help tonight. Um, before we get started, uh, we do have a couple of uh, housekeeping things just to quickly go over. Um, we anticipate this uh, webinar will last roughly 45 minutes to an hour, and there will be an opportunity at the end um, for, for your questions. We will be having a sort of 20 minute to half an hour Q&A session. And without any uh, further ado, I'm going to pass over to Kerry, who is going to kick off this evening's session. Over to you, Kerry. Thanks very much, Callum. That was a fantastic introduction. So this evening, we're here to talk about building a brand. Uh, as Callum mentioned, this is the first of two webinars. Now, tonight, we're going to focus on the things to consider before you start doing the work. Tonight, we're going to talk initially about why even bother looking to build a brand. Then we'll have a look at where you should start when making the consideration. We'll have a quick look at what you will gain if you do build a brand and then probably most importantly we're going to have a look at what damage that's going to do to your pocket. 
I'm sure that some of you recognize some of the logos on screen. Uh, this was the Tesco fake farms branding scandal. Um, Tesco created several brands uh, under the guise and name of individual farms, individual brands who were supposedly small family farms around the UK. Now, why did Tesco do this? Tesco started out, their point of difference was that they were the value range supermarket. It was cheaper to shop at Tesco's than anywhere else. When Lidl and Aldi made their way onto the supermarket scene in the UK, suddenly Tesco had big competition. They were no longer the cheapest, the most price sensitive supermarket. So what they tried to do was set themselves apart as being a supermarket that worked with provenance brands. Now, this backfired on them pretty hideously. Um, it only took consumers a couple of minutes to Google Woodside Farms, Boswell Farms, Willow Farms, to realize that these were entirely fabricated brands. And in some case, they were actually existing farms, but that weren't in the business that they were being labeled as. Now, this turned off consumers and it also turned off producers. This inauthentic branding mess really put Tesco in a lot of hot water. Some of you will remember that actually the National Farmers Union got involved and there were uh, multiple uh, legal claims flying around the place. It got incredibly messy. So why did they bother doing that in the first place? They bothered because provenance is so important to today's customer. Provenance is the thing that will set apart a brand and make it far more valuable, far more desirable. Provenance is about where something comes from. And why is that important to the consumer? Lots of different reasons. Safety is probably number one when it comes to provenance. So that can be safety in uh, the case of knowing that your food has come from a safe supply chain. It can be the transparency within that supply chain, thinking particularly about instances like the horse meat scandal. Provenance builds trust with the consumer. Provenance builds trust that the person producing the goods are doing it in the right way. Provenance is also important for animal welfare. So we see consumer options being driven by animal welfare, particularly, obviously, when it comes to animal produce, meat, dairy, eggs. Consumers in this country are twice as likely to look for produce with provenance from the UK. And even more so in Scotland, 70% of consumers in Scotland who are looking to buy a provenance brand would choose a Scottish brand over an overall UK brand. There's also human rights involved in provenance. So knowing or believing or trusting that the person who's created your food and worked along the supply chain, that there's been a fair approach, a just approach, that there's been good human rights upheld throughout the process. There's also an element of national pride in it. There's also an element of people wanting to buy, consume, use something that's a mark or a stamp of where they come from, something they can align themselves with. Anyone who considers themselves in any way a foodie is going to be looking at buying a brand with provenance, something that says safe, local, real, true, authentic. And then of course you have the environmental benefits. There are more reasons that people choose provenance, but these are the main ones. And if you have a look at this list, you'll see that it's incredibly compelling. You can tick all of these boxes for a consumer simply by having a provenance brand. Culturally, at the moment, provenance branding is 
important. The economic climate is uncertain. That's probably an understatement. Consumers have instant access to information, i.e. they can Google that fake farm in a Tesco supermarket and they can find out the fallacy and the lie behind something that's out there in seconds. Consumers increasingly distrust businesses that feel big or businesses that feel fake or false. People want to feel like they are making a decision that has integrity, honesty, and authority behind it. Quality and authenticity are key selling points. Quality, even more so when you look at our current context within the pandemic, safe and local is being mentioned more and more. People view local food as the safest and highest quality option. And finally, when it comes specifically to food, there is a desire for real and deeper connections. And that's a desire from the consumer wanting to have a real and deep connection with the person who produced it. So you've made the decision, okay, maybe you should bother building a brand. Where do you start doing that? First of all, you have to ask the question, why? That question is, why do you want to build a brand? Why is it important? Why does anybody care about your brand? And why is anyone going to care about what you do? You should continually ask yourself why and make sure that you can really get down to the crux of what it is that you stand for. People don't buy what you do. People buy why you do it. There is a huge emotional element to decision making. And when it comes to building a brand that has longevity and that has brand loyalty, the why reason is the thing that resonates with those advocates. You can think of a, a handful of the top brands in the world. And if you ask the people who love them and follow them and stay loyal to them, they always have an emotionally connected reason. I am a sucker for Apple products. I uh, religiously buy every new model that comes out. But if you ask me why, it's because I believe that they are trying to do technology in a different way. Now, you may completely disagree with that, but as one of their brand advocates, I see that consistently in everything that they tell me which takes us to who. Knowing who your brand is for is key. You have to look at where your audience is, what's important to them, what did they care about from that list of safety, transparency, quality? What do they care about more? Is it environmental attributes or is it animal welfare or is it human rights? You have to go back to your why and make sure that that resonates with the who, that it resonates with your audience, that the people that you want to reach are ready for what you want to reach them with. And then you have to know what it is that you want your brand to achieve, because you can go all in, you can create a beautiful brand with a great ethos, a great reason why, with a vast audience. But if you don't know what your brand is trying to achieve, you're on a road to nowhere. And let me tell you that if your goal is to make money and be successful, then this audience is going to disconnect with you. Your goal, your reason for being has to link back to that why. Your why resonates with your who, which is determined through your goals. I can't underestimate the, overestimate the need for planning. Many, many people decide to start businesses, start enterprise, start building a brand. People start 
all over the place and come at it from many different directions. Having a clearly laid out plan of some kind is going to help you to make sure that you manage to link back to your reason for being, you keep it relevant to your audience and you keep your goals in mind. Now, there are loads of different ways that you can plan a new enterprise or the de development of a brand. There is not necessarily a right way or a wrong way. There is what works for you. I am personally a really big fan of using the um, business canvas. Uh, you can find the business canvas. It's free, available for download. It's used by entrepreneurs all around the world. This is something that keeps your plan flexible and allows you to change as your goals change. Whatever it is that you decide to do, commit to it, have it on paper and don't file it away as a business plan in a drawer never to be looked at again. If you're going to invest the time and invest the inevitable money into building a brand or a new enterprise, make sure that you stick to what you were going to do. And budget. There are so many people now who are able to use technology, who are able to use social media, who are able to use design software, Adobe, Photoshop, and who think that you can build a brand on nothing. And there will be some rare cases out there where people started off with a 500 quid budget and made a multi-million pound business and good for them. But that is absolutely the minority. So knowing that you have to invest in it at the beginning, but knowing exactly how much you have to invest is key. There are a lot of different schools of thought out there as to how much you should invest based on percentage of uh, income and percentage of turnover. I'm not going to give you those facts and figures. What I'm going to tell you is sit down with somebody who understands how this works and get some unbiased advice in what you're trying to create and what that might set you back. And then, Finally, the needle in the haystack, as it were, have a look to see if there's funding out there to support you. So many people start the process of a new enterprise or building a brand with looking for the funding first. When you go to complete a funding application, they're going to want to know what's your budget. They're going to want to know what's your plan to achieve it. They're going to want to know why you're doing this what's the outcome going to be. They're going to want to know who it's for and they're going to want to know the why, the crux of who you are. So make sure that you have those things in place before you go searching for that needle in the haystack. There are some limited pots of funding available for brand building. They are hard to find, hard to access, but not impossible. Scottish Enterprise do have funding available. It's called By Design. There is also funding available through Scottish Edge. If anybody would like to find out more about those funding sources or would like to discuss that, please feel free to drop a question into the question and answer box, or alternatively, you can contact any one of us after this webinar. So there are four cornerstones to building a great connected brand. First of all, roots. Your brand identity and the story that accompanies it needs to be real, authentic and trustworthy. And particularly if you're looking at building an agricultural or rural brand, let me tell you to celebrate what you've got. So many times we see rural clients with amazing natural assets on their doorstep and they don't think that it's a valuable story to tell. You have literally the best, most authentic and most trustworthy story right there in your roots. Clarity in your brand. Know exactly who you are and commit to it. Simple stories are the ones that end up sticking with people and simple stories are the ones that people want to share time and time again. 
make sure that you are clear about your reason why, your reason for being, and be consistent with it. Brands have to be connected. Provenance branding is a great way of connecting you with your local community. It provides you with an opportunity to give something back into that community. However, it also connects you out beyond that local community. You can see provenance branding all over the place where you can look at national brands that use and leverage their provenance as one of their key strengths. This is all done by connecting back to where you come from, connecting back to the community that you belong to. And the final cornerstone, relevance. Your customers, your consumers, your users, they need to care about your story, your origin story. You need to make sure that it's applicable to them. And that comes back to knowing that why and for who you're sharing it. So once you've done all of that, you've committed to it, you, you know why you want to bother building the brand, you roughly know where you're going to start, you've got your, you've got your plan of attack, you know why, you know how much money you've got, you know who it's for. So what do you get back after you've put in all of that effort? So number one, recognition. So regardless of whether you are a producer selling goods or whether you are looking to become the brand of the next spokesperson for Scottish farming, having a brand that people can instantly apply to you gives you that automatic recognition. There is something called top of mind recall in branding, and that's the, the golden ticket, as it were. If a customer or a user or a follower can remember you by your brand or remember your brand by you without needing any prompts, that's top of mind recall. And that's something that big brands pay hundreds of thousands, if not millions for to make sure that they get top of mind recall. You get brand loyalty and that's worth more than anything that money can buy. So that's people repeatedly coming back to you but also advocating for you. It's like having a sales force on the ground that you've never had to pay for. And that sales force will give you word of mouth recommendations. So People want to share brands that they've discovered that they feel are doing all the right things for all the right people. That reputation is so important. Once you have those things, it allows you to start also offering something differentiated. So you may have been producing goods but now you may be able to open an experience or you may be able to move into a different kind of enterprise. And the customers that were with you and trusted you and had loyalty to you in your initial uh, endeavor are going to follow through with you into that differentiated offering. That brand presence is also gonna give you power for a wider audience. It's gonna give you a bigger platform it's going to allow you to talk about more than just the thing that you're creating and creates a space for you within your brand. I'm now going to pass over to Callum, who's going to talk to you about what the payoff is specifically within farming. Thank you very much, Kerry. Yes, as Kerry says, I'm going to, to cover a few slides on what are, what are the benefits to farmers and crofters specifically for building a brand. Well, to kick off, building a brand allows you to add value uh, to your produce or your uh, farming or crofting outputs. Building a brand allows you to increase financial return for your produce and it ensures that any profits are retained at the farm gate. And as many of you will know, um, throughout the supply chain, the more steps in the supply chain, your profits will be reduced. So trying to reduce the steps in the supply chain, selling directly to your consumers or uh, customers will help, um, help you add value and help to keep any profits at the farm gate. 
Building a brand also allows you to strengthen um, farmer to consumer relationships. And as Kerry was saying uh, there, consumers nowadays, they want to know where their food comes from, how their food was grown and how livestock was reared. And that's one positive that I would say that has come out of this COVID um, pandemic is that in the in the run up to lockdown and, and very much throughout lockdown, many consumers turned to local farmers and producers and have continued to support these producers through what has been a very difficult time for them. And generally speaking, this crisis has made people become more aware, so there's now an increased recognition of food miles, air miles, and generally where food is often imported from overseas. So that provenance element is hugely important to both customers and consumers. Building a brand uh, in terms of storytelling, many farmers who supply mainstream markets um, quite often their farming story can get lost as soon as produce leaves the farm. So milk that gets loaded onto a milk tanker or any produce that leaves on a, on a lorry, as soon as it leaves the farm, that story, that real authentic story can get lost. And branding allows you to tell your own unique farming story. Now, as a farmer myself, I'm a firm believer that farming and crofting is steeped in history and everyone listening in tonight will have a brilliant story to tell. Many farms are multi-generational or even new entrants coming into the sector, bringing knowledge, skills and experiences from other sectors into the agricultural industry brings a real breath of fresh air and, and really makes everyone sit up and, and almost question what they're doing, bringing a real um, sense of new ideas, getting involved, and it's brilliant uh, to see. Now, we foresee real growth in food tourism and agri-tourism because consumers do want authentic, real experiences. Nowadays, consumers are looking for hands-on experiences, uh, getting out into the countryside, like living the life of a farmer for a day and also consuming um, the food or drink or the produce that that farm um, that has on offer. And if there is a, an accommodation offering on the farm, um, quite often um, the, the customers will look to make a purchase of any produce that, um, that you've got to then take home with them to share with friends, uh, with their friends and family. In terms of recognition, uh, building a brand allows you to, to create uh, your unique selling point. It allows you to stand out um, from the crowd. And don't be afraid to start small. Uh, a lot of businesses, the, the three examples uh, I'm going to share with you in a minute, they all started relatively small and have built their brand. And starting small allows you to, to get local recognition and then you can scale up to, to regional recognition, national, and if your sort of ambition is to, to, to export, then you can get international um, recognition. Branding in terms of product and range extension, once you've got an established brand, you've got your market penetration, um, you've got real consumer recognition of the, the high quality products uh, and produce that you've got on offer, it's, it's much, much easier to add new products uh, to your product portfolio. It's also easier to test the market. So for example, if a dairy farm uh, went wanted to add value to their milk um, by producing say ice cream, they could launch or certainly test the market for new, um, new flavors and new products, which is generally um, much easier to do. Now that leads me on um, to three rural businesses which have successfully created recognizable brands, uh, the first of which is Forest Farm. Forest Farm is an award-winning organic dairy. Um, based, they're based five miles west of uh, Aberdeen. 
And Forest Farm is home to Scotland's uh, first vending machines, milk vending machines. They, they launched them a number of years ago um, to add value to their, to their milk and also to give the, the local community and passing customers the opportunity to buy fresh milk directly from the farm. As you can see on the screen, um, their brand logo is, is very visual and they've got strong values which are clearly communicated on their website and through social media channels. And I know that website and social media is something we are going to look at in, in more detail as we progress. Um, Forest Farm believe in part of their values uh, is to have is to produce natural products and have natural farming practices. Um, so they don't use any chemical fertilizers, uh, pesticides, herbicides, or indeed uh, genetically modified feeds. And sustainability is at the is, is one of their core uh, values right up until their their finished product. So. Um, for those of you who have, have got to have bought some, some milk from them, they've got reusable and refillable glass bottles, which are not only extremely attractive uh, for milk, uh, I must admit that um, I've got a bottle of, their, uh, of the Forest Farm glass bottles and it's currently got flowers in it. So yes, they can be used for other uh, purposes as well. They tell, uh, they've got a brilliant story, they tell their unique farming story and they've created a real USP, differentiating themselves from other dairy farms uh, across Aberdeenshire and actually across uh, Scotland for that matter. Brand recognition uh, within their local market has enabled them to expand. It's enabled them to sell products uh, widely into farm shops, restaurants, hotels, uh, and also local offices. And I had an interesting chat uh, a few months ago um, before uh, COVID-19 uh, kicked off. And it was really interesting. They were selling milk uh, directly to offices in Aberdeen which is a really nice uh, talking point uh, during business meetings. So when the coffee and tea is, uh, is poured, is it's really nice, it's a really nice um, sort of story and you know, thing to talk about during a client uh, meeting. Brand uh, recognition allows Forest Farm to add uh, new products um, to, their, to their portfolio. And as you can see there, they've uh, just recently introduced um, new products. They've got yogurt, uh, ice cream, and uh, sorbet. And they've also got uh, their little uh, van, which has made an appearance uh, out and about at various events locally. That then, that is a, an example uh, of a dairy farm. My next uh, example is, is a farming business. It's a mixed uh, farming business uh, based just outside um, Perth. Hugh Grierson Organic. Um, Hugh and Sasha um, run a traditional farm. Uh, it's located um, five or six miles uh, on the west side of Perth. They received organic status in 2002 and they rear and finish uh, livestock, beef, pork, uh, chicken, and lamb, as well as growing uh, other crops um, such as potatoes. Grierson Organics, they've got a well-established brand, um, lifestyle, animal welfare, and ecology, and very much environmental stewardship is at the heart of why they exist. It is the heart of why they do what they do, similar to what Kerry was just saying. They started small, uh, they were selling locally at uh, farmers markets, which they continue to do. And they grew into selling to local restaurants, hotels, cafes, and other establishments. They've got a very good web presence and online shop, and they're no now delivering produce all over Scotland. Increasing uh, your brand recognition, or increasing uh, their brand recognition rather, uh, has allowed them to, to scale up uh, their enterprise. And they're now looking uh, to diversify their business further uh, to now offer uh, farm tours and other educational experiences. And I was having a conversation actually with Sasha uh, just the other week there, and she is passionate about telling their farming story, and they do a wonderful job at also raising the profile of organic farming practices. My final example uh, is one south of the border, 
It is Dalesford Farm. Uh, hopefully, uh, a few of you have come across Dalesford before. Dalesford have created an excellent uh, brand. They're based uh, in the Cotswolds, or their, or their main sort of farming enterprise and farm shop is based in the Cotswolds, although they have also got uh, retail outlets in London. Now, animal welfare, sustainability, and environmental stewardship is very much at the heart of what they do uh, and why they do it. And these core values, these brand values, are instilled in all of their staff, and it's a hugely important factor for their customers. I was uh, very lucky uh, through my job at SEC Consulting a few years ago. Um, I was I went down to the farm retail uh, conference and we had a visit to, to Dalesford. And I remember the farm manager Richard uh, Smith explained that Dalesford is they've, they're part of all the accreditation schemes. They've got the red tractor. They've got organic um, status, they've also got pasture for life, but they are actively trying to create what they term the Dalesford standard. They want to be a level above the rest because they want to provide the very best um, for their animals and for the environment. And I thought that was just brilliant. It was a brilliant story and a brilliant um, sort of ethos uh, to have. Dalesford have a very strong purpose um, and they're farming with real integrity and uh, personality. And that personality really comes across uh, on their website and on their social media platforms. Dalesford are very much a market leader um, down south. They're, they're leading what I would term leading a, a, a direction of travel in farming and uh, in the farming and rural business sector. Health, wellness, lifestyle, sustainability is all very much core um, to Dalesford's uh, brand and brand values. They also offer cookery workshops, cookery demonstrations, they do for foraging, uh, they've got seasonal recipes, and if you check them out on uh, Instagram, they've got their, uh, their summer um, recipes on the go at the moment. They've also got an on-site nutritionist, which is really cool. Uh, they do yoga, Pilates, and they're what I would term a, a real rural destination. And one thing I, I would like to finish off on this is Dalesford, the Dalesford brand, they've really built what I would term a community. They're very welcoming and very engaging. And I actually quite recently tuned into one of their uh, live streams on social media. Um, which was to do with nutrition and uh, and health, and I was made to feel very welcome and actually almost part of the Dalesford family, even though I am based in uh, in Scotland. So that is what I would term three brilliant examples um, of farm businesses or certainly rural businesses um, that have created and developed successful brands. I'm now going to hand back over to Kerry to take us on to the next part. Thanks very much, Callum. Some great examples there. So that's all well and good, looking at inspiring examples, talking about some of the theory behind it, but we know that the reality of building a compelling, connected and engaging brand is that it's going to cost something. What we would like to do in this webinar is be as realistic as possible about what those costs might look like. So firstly, you have to consider an initial creative investment. So this is the actual creation and design of your brand. That's not just a logo, it's your tone of voice, it's your communication, it's your brand language, it's potentially your website, your social media accounts, and maybe even packaging for physical products, signage for physical premises. Brand consultancy will usually run somewhere from two to £20,000, depending on how in-depth you go. Some brands consultancy will do by the hour, and they'll do ad hoc. So uh, much like with a lawyer, you can call up and pay for time on the hour to get consultancy on what you should do. 
the actual design services, so engaging a creative to go through logo iterations, design process, kickoff meetings, you're probably looking at about 3,000 to again 25,000. Now, I am assuming that most people looking to start a new brand are usually looking to do it for as little as possible. The lower end of all of these ranges is the realistically lowest price that you should consider spending to get quality work. Photography and videography are key to creating a great brand that can live online and particularly at the moment where we are all distanced, most of us have been in lockdown for a significant amount of time, we are spending more and more time online and we want to look at great images and watch great high quality, high well produced videos that tell us exactly who you are. Yes, you could possibly do that yourself, but to get a professional standard, you are probably looking at about £150 per hour for that photographer, videographer get your money's worth, know exactly what you want to ask them for and book them for two hours. Your initial creative investment also for your web design. Now, web design is something I get asked about a lot. Do I need a website if I have social media? Uh, how much should I be spending on a website? Should I even be spending anything on a website if I can do it myself on WordPress? Now, the answer to those questions is long. And I'm more than happy to take individual questions at the end if you have them. What I will say is if you are looking to use your website for any purpose other than to direct people elsewhere. So if you want to take a booking, if you want to make a sale, if you want to uh, look at any form of e-commerce, I would strongly advise getting a professional to build your website. Basic web design usually runs from 4,000 to 15,000 pounds. That's just the initial setup of the website. However, an awful lot of web designers will try to charge you more and they will try to charge you more, particularly if they think that you don't understand what you're asking for. So a really key tip and piece of advice is spend a little more on that brand consultancy have somebody that can advocate for you with the designer, with the photographer, with the videographer, with the web developer to make sure that you're being charged only for the things that you absolutely need. Now, while we talk about the damage, I'm now going to pass you over to Caroline. Thanks very much, Kerry. Um, not sure how I feel about being being labelled damage, um, but uh, yeah. So I, I think probably um, I'll, I'm going to jump in here with a, a sort of a question about. We've heard a lot about building brands. Now I'm a trademark person, and I think it's worth just spending a moment explaining the difference and the interaction between what a brand is and what a trademark is. So. We've got the whys and the who's and the planning and bringing everything together, identifying your your story and your values. That is your brand. That's everything that, that Kerry and Callum have been explaining. The trademark is an intellectual property asset um, and it's registrable. And what it can do is it can actually hold all of that reputation and all of that goodwill. Um, Goodwill fluctuates. You heard about the, the Tesco scandal right at the start of this, this presentation. So goodwill can, uh, can have good days and bad days. The trademark is a monopoly right. It's yours. Um, and the big question is always, you know, how much is a, is a trademark going to cost me? Which is a very good question. And, you know, with all the budgeting considerations, one you should ask. And I'm going to give quite a loyally answer in that it depends but I'm going to explain why. So every trademark should reflect your business presently as well as your plans for the future. And trademarks are classified in one of 45 different sections. So everything that you could possibly think of 
will be shoehorned into one single trademark class. And the more classes you involve and include in a trademark application, the higher the costs. So you'll see on the slide here, I've, I've got a fabricated example of a, a dairy farm that also has a cheese school and a, a bed and breakfast on the side. Different customers, different sales channels, different levels of experience, different reputations. However, if you're using the same name, each of those elements should be captured. So milk and cheese, you know, the actual products, they fall in the same class. But then the instruction, the, the school, um, that's, that's separate. And then the overnight accommodation, that's separate again. So when you're looking at protecting your brand using the vehicle of a trademark, which at its core is a source identifier, a trademark is a, is a way of allowing your customers to distinguish your goods and services from those of your competitors. That's its core function. As you build the brand and it gets more established, it will have other um, uses, mainly to talk about the qualitative function of something. You can explain whether the customer should expect um, a high price point or a low price point. The, the, all the stuff that, that Kerry was saying about provenance, all these communication functions that you can actually capture in a trademark. But right at the start, it's so people can identify you, so they know who you are. So when you're looking at tying that down and getting it registered, think about what you're doing now and what you're doing later. So at this point, I'm going to ask everyone to, to put their hand out in front of them. Fingers spread, spread wide. Very center of your palm. That's what you're doing right now. It's your core business. If you weren't doing that, there wouldn't be a business. That is what you have to protect. Then around the outer side of your palm, the main, main chunk of your hand, that's what you have aspirations to do. It's where you see potential for diversification and growth in the next three to five years. And then the outer tips of your fingers, that's what you don't necessarily do. You might do it, but you'd be annoyed if somebody else, if another company came along and did that. You should think about all of these considerations uh, when you're looking to, to tie your trademark down. And there's a very good budgeting reason for that. If you look at the bottom half of the, the slide there, you'll see that I've given you some guide, guide costs. If you're using one trademark class, so say you just wanted to protect the milk and the cheese, you're looking at round figures, a thousand pounds, although being a, a sort of car salesman, I should, I should say it comes under a thousand pounds. To expand that protection, to include the cooking instruction, for example, in the B&B, &B, you only add around 200 pounds. So to get something that is pretty good, it doesn't cost a huge amount more to get something that's ideal and allows you to grow and protect you. So trademarks, once registered, last for 10 years. Um, but I think the advice here is to, to speak to someone that knows what they're doing, um, who can advise you on what makes sense. And uh, I guess to to build a cost-effective strategy. I wouldn't suggest that you try and guess the trademark classes that you need. The best thing to do is, is take a, you know, work with a, a good advisor who can understand your business, who understands the potential for growth. They, they will tell you which classes they recommend um, and it can be chopped and changed for budgeting purposes. Um, you'll also potentially have a load of different marks Again, share as much of this information with your advisor as possible, um, because what can be drawn out are the key trademarks and then the sub brands that can sit under it. Um, finally, I mean, I would, I suppose I would say this, but I really would urge you not to think of trademark registrations as a cost, because they're an investment into everything that Kerry and Callum have been saying. They are what can hold your entire story, all of your values, and that sort of combination of what you say about yourself and what others say about you, that is what a trademark can contain and add value to your entire business.
So damage, yes, but uh, perhaps an opportunity as well. Thanks, Kerry. Thanks very much, Caroline. Absolutely, damage in terms of damage to the pocket, but the damage done to the reputation and the ownership of a brand without this is far more significant. Thank you very much, Caroline. There are some other ongoing costs when it comes to building that brand. So you, you may have invested cash in the initial creative development. You may well, hopefully, have invested cash in the very important piece of protecting that brand and protecting your future growth. But that can't stop at that point. You can't create something, walk away from it, and hope that it will thrive. Um, many, many of my houseplants would agree with that statement. You have to make sure that you continue to input into your brand as it lives. The photography and videography costs that we discussed earlier, that will be ongoing. You will want to have new content being created. You will, if you have a website, you will need to pay a hosting fee for having that website. You will need to pay for licenses. You will need to pay for security. You will also need to pay for things like SEO, search engine optimization. You'll need to pay for keywords. You'll need to pay to analyze how your website is performing. You're going to need to make sure that your website is always updated, that it's always working across different operating systems and different platforms, be it phone, be it PC, be it touchscreen, be it mobile. You're going to have to think about an inbound marketing strategy. That means how are you going to draw people to you to make sure that you get a return on that investment, which in itself requires further investment. You're going to have to think about a social media strategy. How do you communicate? How do you signpost? How often, be that in time or be that in money, are you going to have to invest every day, every week, every month? Are you ready to invest in proper marketing activity to support the ongoing growth of your brand? Yes, it's cost. Yes, it requires investment of time and money. But once you have planned for that, accepted it, hopefully got some funding for it and got over the initial hurdle, the return of a strong brand means that these things will happen naturally. And what if you're not willing to spend? I work with clients every day who tell me, oh, my, my brother-in-law went to uni with a guy who I think works in IT now, and uh, he's going to build that website for me. And that website doesn't work. Constant errors, cannot access content, doesn't do what it needs to do. Oh, I've got a really artistic friend who's going to design my logo for me. probably needed somebody to say, hey, I'm not entirely sure that that looks like a maple syrup tap, nor am I entirely sure that that looks like an oven. I don't need to pay someone to advise me on my brand. I've got a great idea for a name and it's going to look great on the packaging. I'm sure that um, Fashion Fart were happy with their name choice in the end. And it wouldn't be right to close off a webinar that started out by discussing Tesco's failings without finishing with one of their most epic fails from the last year. So we are going to, in our next webinar, Thursday the 23rd of June, also at 8 p.m., we are going to go into detail in what comes next. So we're going to look actively at the design process. So the timeline for that, what should be included at every stage. And we're also going to look at what actually makes a good logo. And that's everything from the colors used to the font used to the shape that it takes. We're going to have a good look at that web element 
to help answer those questions. Do I need a website? And if so, what does it need to do for my brand? Also within the web element, we're going to look back to that logo and talk about things like favicons and does your logo appear in a search bar correctly? And the final thing we're going to look at is how brands use social media effectively for free to grow their presence and drive their future ambition. Thank you very much, Kerry. And yes, some brilliant examples at the end there. And it just shows how important it is to, to sense check uh, your brand before uh, before launching. And actually, a, a little investment uh, can go a long way uh, to avoid some major fails uh, for that matter. Um, keep your questions coming in. We are receiving a few questions. Um, they're coming in thick and fast now. Um, I'm going to kick off with what hopefully should be a fairly straightforward uh, one. I don't know. Uh, it's a question that often comes up uh, in these webinars, and it's around funding. Um, so I think I'll direct this one uh, specifically to you, Kerry. Um, is there anywhere uh, specifically online, or is there anywhere that you would recommend that people can um, keep an eye out for any funding that becomes available? Yeah, absolutely. So I would say if you are not currently engaged with your local business gateway, now would be a great time to do that. Um, I'm not affiliated with them in any way. Um, it's a free service for um, small and startup businesses. Um, what Business Gateway can do is give you a business advisor that can advise on a number of different things for growth for your business. But the other thing that they do is advise you on funding streams that are available through Scottish Enterprise that you can't access without first uh, going through Business Gateway. Uh, a Business Gateway advisor can then advise whether or not you would be eligible for something like the By Design grant, which I think I mentioned earlier. Um, By Design funds innovations in design. So if you were, for example, looking to do something with packaging for a product, then By Design can fund a specific amount of that. Business Gateway could also um, provide some advice around the other Scottish Enterprise Innovation Grants. Um, the other thing I would try to have a look at when it comes to funding is sector specific stuff. So if you are in the food and drink production part of an enterprise, following people on social media like Scotland Food and Drink would be a great place to see that funding stream appear. If you're in tourism, agri-tourism, following the Scottish Tourism Association on social media, you're more likely to see the funding streams there. And uh, if it's pure farming and agriculture, then following the Farm Advisory Service, following um, SAC Consulting, National Farmers Union, whoever it may be, are great ways to see what funding's coming up. Um, Caroline, did you have anything to add when it comes to the legal side of stuff? Yeah, so again, linking in with SE, so there is um, funding through the Intellectual Property Office uh, for IP audits, uh, which is very, very useful. Uh, so if you are a brand focused business, which I'm presuming everyone on this webinar is, uh, you can basically build a case for why branding is uh, important to you, why intellectual property is important to you, and then you get uh, really generous funding if, if your application is successful, uh, where a lot of the strategic costs can be um, covered for you, and then uh, it, it sets you up as a good platform. So again, just through SE. Brilliant. Great, thank you. Thank you both. Yeah, so just generally keeping an eye out and, um, you know, following these various uh, companies and representative organisations uh, should, fingers crossed, uh, open up some uh, opportunities. But yeah, we're not, don't hold us to that, please. Um, I'm, our next question, I, I'm going to direct uh, to you, Caroline, uh, which I think, if I've picked this up correctly, uh, relates to your specific example. Uh, and that is around uh, trademarks. So 
within a business would if if a business has multiple sort of enterprises um this example is would you know if there was three parts of the business would they all need to trade under the same business name good question uh no is the answer um so what you would quite often see i mean they can these things are very flexible so they can trade under the same name however if they serve different sectors it can be quite useful to split them apart you could have an overarching brand name which could just be the name of of the farm or the company um, and then have these sub brands that sit underneath it but there's absolutely no problem your danger comes potentially in a budgeting uh, exercise where if you have a different brand a different mark for every offering it can increase the protection costs uh, to make sure that everything's tied up. So what we, you know, every every situation will be different, but what I work with some people, uh, they have an overarching brand name, but then more descriptive names underneath to distinguish the different uh, products or sectors of interest, uh, which is a way of keeping your, your protection costs down, but still maybe using different color indicators and again, these different things. But I suppose speak to speak to the advisor, see what makes sense um, for a, an intelligent uh, strategy on, on how best to protect your interests. But there's no right answer uh, in terms of should you always use the same name. Using the same name can be easier in terms of there's greater market presence and therefore it's easier to gain traction. Um, but there are equally good reasons to, to run different names uh, for different offerings. Thank you, Caroline. It's something I picked up uh, during your slides there that generally speaking, you would advise getting in touch with an advisor really early on uh, in, in the sort of ideas stage. There may be there may be a few people out there tonight that are perhaps thinking about it, um, but maybe not quite sure about, you know, picking up the phone, not really quite sure uh, about the process. What would your sort of general rule of thumb, would you say, yes, just pick up the phone, have a conversation, or is there anything that they need to do before uh, having that initial conversation with an advisor? I would say there it isn't possible to be too early because at least putting somebody on notice, this is what I plan to do. So I think there's quite a distinction um, and sometimes a bit of a disconnect between um, the creatives and the legals. And the creatives will be very interested in your, your values, your story, so that they can bring all these things together and create a, a logo and an, or a name that represents who you are. However, if it's not legally available for use, if somebody else has already come up with that name before, rather than spending thousands of pounds finessing this idea, the better thing to do is to speak to the design people and the legal people at the same time. So go to the brand people with your, with your vision, with your story, with your plan, and then say, I'm going to speak to a legal advisor when they give you, you know, sort of three to five options maybe to consider which is your favorite. Um, check it's available because how heartbreaking is it if you spent all this time and money creating something that truly is a genuine reflection. And because somebody's got there first and has registered it, they can stop you using it. And then it's all manner of horror and if you've got to change your name. And it's not the designer, you know, the designers are very rarely qualified to, to make a legal assessment of whether or not a name is available. So um, anyone on this, uh, on this webinar, um, I'm very happy to, to arrange individual calls with with anybody on a no charge no obligation basis just to kind of chat through your situation and and see if i can point everybody in the right direction and, and help however i can so um everyone's different which makes the advice difficult but it's never too early is probably the theme that's great thank you you're going to be inundated with calls now Ed caroline <laughs> <laughs> Not tonight. <laughs> no, no, not tonight. Maybe tomorrow, but not tonight. Um, one thing I picked up, Caroline, was that actually uh, investment in uh, trademark uh, classes around around one thousand pounds, just maybe slightly over a thousand pounds, and they last for ten years. Is that is that right? 
Yes. Uh, so, like I mentioned, there's 45 classes. So, it would be very, very unusual, and only mega brands would protect in anything like, you know, 30, 40 classes. Um, I suppose the point that I was trying to make is to to get a good trademark which lasts you 10 years. Yes, starting point a thousand pounds. However, to include a second class, it does not go to two thousand pounds and a third class three thousand pounds, uh, which is why I think planning, which was a, a point, Kerry, you were you were making, is really important um, in terms of working out what you want to do. Um, so once registered, yes, it sits there quite happily, and if you're using it. There are obligations to, to use it for the goods and services which you've protected, um, which kick in after five years. But yeah, once you're set for 10 years, it is yours. Anyone else comes along and uses that same mark for similar, same similar goods or services. You contact someone like me and uh, say, mm, excuse me, please don't do that. I have this trademark. And it is so valuable. It is so much harder to stop somebody else copying your brand if you haven't got a registered trademark it is just it's not even a conversation if you've got a trademark I have this you're doing it stop immediately um but yeah so every 10 years but that's it's not like the business plan you don't put it in a drawer either um if as your business changes and the way you use your marks change you sort of have like I call it an IP sort of MOT where you just sort of check in have a quick call what's changed in the last 12 months, what's on the horizon, so that you're you're ready. Um, like I say, you've got five years to use a trademark. Um, so you don't have to wait until the product is ready to launch. You can get your trademark registered and then two years later, it can go to market. So again, it's never too early. Well, if it's six years, it is too early, but five years um, to get yourself organized. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Caroline. Well, I think that sort of concludes our Q&A session. Um, thank you for those who have chipped in with questions. Apologies if we haven't got a round to answering all of them. Is there so, any I've missed, Kerry, just before we wrap up? Uh, Is there anything I've missed? There is one specific question once again for Caroline um, about the uh, uh, an attendee was under the impression that the UK and EU are under the same trademark law for the time being. Is the differentiation between UK and EU part of a new directive? Um, so the it is it is accurate to say that the UK and the EU is under the same law insofar as the EU laws currently still apply to the UK. They do have separate legislation governing them. Uh, the rules uh, pertinent to Brexit are if you have a registered trademark by the end of the transition period in the EU, it will automatically clone across to the UK register. However, basically last week would have been the deadline to do that because of the opposition periods and the time it takes to get an EU applic uh, application proceeding through to registration, basically. Um, so it's it's not accurate to say that they are the same, um, but they are still connected. Um, but if you already have an EU mark, you don't need to take any action. Um, so I'd, I'd be happy to pick up with the, the attendee for the this, if there's something more particular that they they were interested in but uh they are not harmonized in in every sense come uh come the end of the year that's great thank you caroline um callum i just wanted to reinforce just before we close off for the evening um contact details are here on the screen please do feel free to contact any of the three of us following this webinar this webinar has been recorded so if you want to revisit and catch up on anything then please do feel free you can access it from the farm advisory service website and thank you uh, on behalf of the Farm Advisory Service. Thank you to Kerry uh, and Caroline. Thank you both very much for your time this evening. It's really interesting. Lots of uh, food for thought. And yes, we uh, look forward to seeing you both uh, again on Thursday. And that concludes our session this evening.
thank you both thank you everyone for tuning in tonight and enjoy the rest of your evening